Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode 22 of our Secular Bible Study series, and today I'm looking at Song of Songs, or also known as Song of Solomon. What a strange book to be included in the biblical canon, especially when you consider that it's following Ecclesiastes. But Song of Songs is intense. It is erotic poetry, plain and simple. The reason that it was included in the canon is probably the claims that it is an allegory. We will talk about that in point six, reception and influence. But for point one, book overview, let's just talk about what this is. Ironically enough, speaking from my own personal experience, this seems to be the book that your teachers and Sunday school teachers and parents didn't want you to read. No problem. Who cares about your kids reading Genesis and Exodus? After all, everyone loves the destruction of the entire earth, genocide, mass murder, rape, incest, slavery, child abduction, polygamy, concubines, etc. But we wouldn't want our kids exposed to something like this book, which is erotic for the sake of being erotic. Even though it is between one man Man and one woman, even though it is within the context of a wedding, a marriage, there is something about the graphic nature of this book that is simply describing what is the beautiful part of love and passion and sex that really rubs Christians the wrong way. Many Christians, I should say. That has always baffled me. I have always been aware of this as a believer and a non-believer. This book is one of the tamest books in the entire Bible when you consider all of the things that are not included in this. It is also a book where we get, I think, only one reference to God if you don't impose all of this allegory onto it. And for lack of a better term, even despite the subject matter, it's kind of wholesome for a biblical book. So what is it? It's eight chapters of a soon to be married and then married bride and bridegroom. And these eight chapters here are just a back and forth. There are different, it's not narrative. It's not linear in time. This is just kind of a free for all, very poetic in style in that sense. It almost feels dreamlike, like you're waking up and you're over here and the setting has changed. Sometimes it's in a vineyard. Sometimes it's in a lush garden. Sometimes it's deep in the wilderness. Sometimes it's about the woman. Sometimes about the man. Sometimes she's dreaming or alone in her bed. Sometimes he's lusting after her. It just really feels, again, very non-tangible. And they go back and forth, seeking each other, finding each other, desiring each other, getting close to having each other, and then it kind of breaks up again. There are a couple weird inserts here of Solomon. Like at the very end, we have this scene of Solomon trying to buy love, which is literally like right after it says, you can't do that. In 8.7, it says, if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. And then like four verses later, we have Solomon had a vineyard and it goes on and he tries to buy love and gets rejected. So the bridegroom in here is not Solomon. So sometimes this book is from her perspective and sometimes it is from his perspective. Again, kind of an intro and an outro, some weird stuff from Solomon, but that's it. It's very short. You could read this in a few minutes. In fact, fun trivia for you, out of all of the 66 books in the Protestant canon, this comes in at number 44 for length, only 2,020 words. The shortest book is 3rd John at 219 words, but again, 2,000 words is not Nothing. And that's it. That's the book overview. That's everything that's happening here. So we're going to really dive in in points two through six. There's not much to cover in seven, thankfully. So let's move straight on to authorship. Traditional authorship goes to Solomon. He's even referenced at the beginning. Shoot, I just closed the Bible, but what does it say? Chapter one, verse one, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. So my version, the ESV actually calls the entire book, the song of Solomon, and it puts him as the bridegroom. So like at the beginning of chapter four, it says Solomon admires his bride's beauty. I just think this is fundamentally wrong and we'll get into that here in a second. But for one, it would seem strange to have Solomon be the author because he actually comes in again at the end and tries to buy love. Also, we know he buys love. He has concubines and 700 wives that were done for political purposes, thousands of women that he sleeps with or could sleep with. And he's just desiring after this one and this wholesome, beautiful love, not Solomon. <laughs> So why does it get attributed to Solomon? Well, it's considered part of the wisdom literature of the Bible. Ecclesiastes tries to get tied to him. Proverbs is tied to him. But also from that, we can know that the style is extremely different from what Solomon typically writes. The scholarly idea here is that this is not written by Solomon, that it is not even one author, that really what this is, is this is a compilation of love and erotic poems put together in some kind of a narrative, again, with this bride and bridegroom going back and forth. But that's why it's jumping around from place to place. They got the best love songs out there, put them together in this compilation, and now it's the Song of Songs, like the King of Kings or the Lord of Lords. It's just the Hebrew way of saying, this is the best. Here they are. You want to make it a wisdom book, so you slap the wise guy's name on it. Bam, 
Done. Song of Solomon. So that's the roots of it. But again, no good scholarly reason to assume he actually had anything to do with this book. And as for date, we're probably looking between the 6th and 3rd century BCE. This would be during the post-exile period. So that's really all there is to say about authorship and date. Moving into point three, point three is going to be very short. It's historical context and accuracy. We have really nothing to bump this up against. There are no archaeological evidences that are going to provide us proof or disproof of this book. What I can tell you is that all around this area, the ancient Near East at this time, people were writing love, poetry, erotic songs, etc. It's par for the course, which is one of the biggest reasons that I think this is what it looks like. This is a collection of love poems. This is not an allegory. We're going to talk about the allegory in point six. So hold that. Let's put that on the shelf. But I think that it is very obvious that the people of Israel were doing what everyone else around them was doing, what they were exposed to in Babylon and by the Persian by the Assyrians, etc. They all have their own version of this that looks really, really similar. Which brings me to a point many people did not watch one of my favorite episodes I've put out, which is 10 Alternative Ancient Books of Wisdom. So go check that out if you missed that one. It was like two Sundays ago and it did very poor for a Sunday video. But kind of the same thing. It shows what other cultures were doing at this time and that these works are not all that special. So that's all for that. Let's move on to point four, literary analysis. There's a lot that we can say about this. First of all, it's lyrical poetry. It's supposed to sound good, to sound pleasant, to have some cadence, some rhythm. It's meant to be artistic, exaggeratory, etc. In terms of techniques, this is all about rich metaphors, vivid imagery, and natural symbolism. Chapter seven is, how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter? Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like fawns, twins of a gazelle. You can see those three things at play throughout the entire book. And it's quite lovely. The use of these natural things like doves and trees and ponds, etc., to describe the physical attributes of what you love about the other person is as tale as old as time. This is what all poets in love have tried to do, from your modern day bad teenage poetry all the way back to the cream of the crop of ancient Near Eastern literature. In addition to this, there's also very sensuous descriptions, the metaphors that are stretched further about the scent and taste and feel of kiss or skin or privates. When she references her ripe pomegranate juice. That's what makes all the church mothers blush. When you add in those additions and kind of taking it to that next level, we really get the sexual tension and the passion that this book is trying to convey. The book does use dialogue structure going back and forth between what he said and what she said, and a variety of other literary techniques that we've already talked about, mainly being repetition and parallelism or even inverted parallelism. It's a cool book to be included in the canon. Its themes are even different, so we can get into that. I mean, point five main themes. I'm going to go with the main themes if you took this book at face value, not if you take it as an allegory, because you can pull a lot out of this if you want. There's not many sermons done on the Song of Songs, but when they do happen, it's one of two ways. Either it's a sermon about waiting till marriage and the beautiful gift that God gives those who wait, healthy sexual relationship, which is where I would make this stuff very problematic because it has been used to endorse a purity culture that is extremely hard harmful, not just to the individual, but to the individual's sex life in the future. That's just been proven. We will talk about that in future videos. Or the sermons are used as an allegory in which you can bend and create any theme that you want. So what themes do I see in it if we're taking it for what it is, ancient love and erotic poetry? Well, the first would be longing and desire. The entire beginning of this is seeking and finding each other. The absolute craving and craziness that overcomes someone in love who's dying to be with the other, who is so excited to be married and for what that will entail for them. It's beautiful. It's well done. The tension is there. We see it from both parties. We see it when they're not with each other. We see it when they first find each other. We see it when they're finally together. It's beautiful. Longing and desire. Surprisingly enough, mutual love and equity also seems to abound in this book. Another reason why it probably was not written by Solomon, who viewed women obviously, as pawns in his politics or a convenience in his bedroom. But this book is, again, pretty fair and balanced between the perspective of each, each wanting and respecting and desiring the other person on an emotional and a physical level. Wow. 
almost healthy. And lastly would just be the celebration of love and desire and intimacy. This is a book that rallies for love. It's a good thing. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. So much of the ancient world was about death, fighting off death, disease, slavery, destruction, etc. So what is the other force in the world equally as strong? Love. Again, this book champions love. I think it's really really incredible. And it makes me think though, the one problem I have, and you know what, I'll just save this for 0.7 since we don't have too much to talk about then. Putting a pin in that. Let's move on to point six, reception and influence. Okay, this is where I want to talk about allegory. There are two allegorical camps here. One, we have how Judaism takes it, and two, how Christianity takes it. Within Judaism, this is a book about God and Israel, or it can often be taken that way. God is the bridegroom, Israel is the bride. This is about God's love for his chosen people. The same thing is done within Christianity, except Paul helps us extend the metaphor to Jesus in the church. Once again, the very fact that these two groups of people who have the same Bible, well, I guess they don't entirely have the same Bible, who pray to the same God, who read his words for his wisdom, cannot agree on what this book is trying to teach them seems incredibly problematic. What I had mentioned earlier in point three, historical context, was that we see this kind of writing all over the ancient Near East and really most cultures throughout the world in time. Were all of them some big allegory about their God and their people? No, they were taken for what they are. People have always felt love and infatuation and lust and sought after sex and intimacy and closeness. And those people have written about that, just like they've written about most things, like in Ecclesiastes, how sometimes it feels like life doesn't mean anything, or in Proverbs about what it means to be wise, right? We're seeing the wealth of human emotion, and this book is capturing one of those emotions that is very strong, and it's love. And I think that it denigrates it and downplays it when you have to make it about an allegory, which I understand is like the only way you can fit it into the Bible, because there's really no other themes to take from it, biblically speaking, or no other biblical connections within it, except stamping Solomon name on it. And the reasons and the lengths that people go through to try to make this fit some allegorical purpose, I think is crazy. Like when I was reading you guys, how beautiful are your feet and sandals, your rounded thighs, right? You have feet, thighs, navel, belly, breast, neck, eyes, nose, head. You have all these body parts listed here and they're all compared to something. And I've seen the pastors try to connect the dots. Well, okay, really the, the feet are this, you know, that's how God shows that he's carrying us through the, the wilderness of our doubt. And, and the, the two breasts are actually the Old and New Testament. What? When this was written, there was no concept of there being a New Testament. What a reach. The breasts are not the two different testaments. Sometimes a tit is just a tit. And that's what the breasts here are. I just hate that religious people couldn't leave this book alone. That the one time these ancient people were able to remove God from the equation and just relish in the love and desire that they got to enjoy in their life. Nope, that's not okay with us. We've got to map this on to us being a chosen people. We've got to map this on on how Christ is going to let us in and graft us into his saving grace from hell. Like, it really bums me out that this book is taken advantage of in that way. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that was the intended purpose, or at least the intended purpose during the compilation process when they took what once was truly love poems and erotic literature and said, okay, well, this is a core part of our history. And these are our people who've written these things. This is the best of it, the Song of Songs. Let's put Solomon's name on it, call it wisdom, and make it an allegory. Maybe that happened. But at some point, this that was clearly just good love poetry for the sake of good love poetry got taken advantage of and used for biblical or theological purposes. And it makes me kind of sad. Behind the camera, you can't see right now, is an entire quarter of the bookshelf dedicated to poetry. It was my first love. When I started reading, I read poetry. Not very cool for a teenage boy, but I have an immense amount of appreciation for it. And like I said, I think that we are robbing this ancient culture of what was actually happening and that they documented by trying to include it in this fashion. So those are the main two different religious receptions. Obviously, the rest of the influence that has trickled down from this is huge. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That's straight from Song of Songs chapter six. That and 
many other beautiful phrases have been taken and ran with from here. We see references in Persian mystic poetry like Rumi. We see references in Islamic literature to Song of Songs. And again, it's got to be probably the most common thing to hear quoted at a wedding ceremony. That's it for point six. Point seven is going to be contradictions and problematic passages, but it's hard. There's not really a lot of contradictions. There's nothing stated here in a theological sense. Again, if we took the allegory route, we could definitely say there's an issue here, there's an issue here. I've given you the brief high-level view of why I think that that doesn't work, so I'm not going to then say here's the contradictions from it. In terms of problematic passages, what I was alluding to earlier is not so much that the passage itself is problematic, but what sucks, what I think is just a huge miss that would have been so amazing is we finally got like an admittance of love being okay, of sex being okay, and a good thing, even a gift from God. We could have ran with that thread and taken so much of the guilt and shame out of our natural base desires that if this God were real, he definitely put into us. Furthermore, it's so focused on that initial phase of infatuation and lust, which is fine, but man, it's missing the mark on true long-term commitment between partners, which is something that really never gets shown well in the Bible. It's all power dynamics and slaves and multiple wives and misogyny, etc. We finally got close to equity, but it was only in the initial stage, yet alone the love of a parent to a child. What if we had a book that was on par with how amazing a gift it is to have children and take care of them and watch them grow and develop, etc., and not to abuse them. We don't have anything like that in the entire Bible. So I see this as not problematic in and of itself, but a true marking of what the Bible could have been if there was a true, all-benevolent, wise God that was inspiring or author in it. People love to look at the Bible and its collection of books and say, hey, wow, look at this thing. How instrumental in history. There's never been a book like it. And yeah, those things are true. But can you imagine what a collection of books by the creator of the universe actually would look like? I get tiny little glimpses or imaginations based off very rudimentary versions. And it makes me not long for a God, so to speak, but see how far we miss. And it's really sad. And I think that's the biggest thing that this book shows to me that highlights the problematic nature of the Bible. So I'll leave it at that. Nice short one for you for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about it, your experiences with this book, what you think I got wrong, if you think there is a good case for allegory, etc. So thank you for watching. I've got a great video lined up for you this Sunday. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconic List, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, and my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Roquette, and Sparky, as well as all my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in this mission or just enjoy watching the content, please consider joining these fine patrons and supporting the channel. Thanks and have a great day.